All right, it's Friday morning. We're all very tired, but you are welcome to OTB AM at quarter to eight. Delighted to have you uh, with us, myself and Owen, with you as always on a Friday morning to Owen. Morning, Adrian. How are things? Uh, things are good. You're just been telling us you're a little bit uh, hungover. No, I haven't. That's an absolute <laughs> lie. I'm absolutely fresh you as do, a daisy. You understand that's the dynamic of the way these things works. That you know, you say a little bit off air, and we exaggerate it when we go on air. I, my heart goes out to all those people, all those other people who were at the Rolling Stones last night, mm. who had about fifty years on me. Like, how are they feeling this morning? Yeah. is what I think. Probably. There was. We were both at the Rolling Stones last night. Um, separately. Separately. Um, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, and it did strike me at one point, right, that you bring up that point. The Rolling Stones said. Dublin, how are we doing? And I looked around and there was like a lot of, I was, go I was going to say middle-aged, but that is not accurate at all. I would say elderly people around. And my thought was that the general consensus was, ah, I'm not bad, a bit of a sore back, a bit of a limp, the old gut isn't great. Yeah. That it wasn't an audience that are uh, necessarily in the fit of their health, you know? No, but uh, like you look at somebody like Charlie Watts on the drum last night, who uh, like is genuinely an OAP like he is the definition of he is the, he is kind of like he should be in an ad for, for like a loan or whatever those those things are like he's a, he's an old guy he's a very old guy they're all very old guys i mean i think one of them is a great grandfather and like i mean to be fair to i, I think when the concert started up you're thinking holy shit these guys are old like they're very very old uh, but as it went on you kind of thought well they're st still very much able to rock it out but uh, i mean at least the other three, uh, Keith Richards and Ron, Ronnie Wood and Mick Jagger, er, who everybody knows their names, and then the drummer, who nobody's ever known his name until you've just uttered it just now. Everybody knows. Um, uh, he's, he's quite famous. He's, he's been there for like 50-something years, I'm, as they all have. I'm exaggerating. But um, they all make it like a fairly big... Like they've cha they're changing costumes and they're wearing rock and roll gear, like some serious class rock and roll gear. And well, Charlie you, Watts looks as if he's on the, on the way down to uh, Marks and Spencer's. He's yeah, like you, you haven't... He's pulled up around his waist and... Well, you haven't actually kind of taken it upon yourself to get into their s style, basically, this morning. I expected you to rock in with one of those Jagger jackets, Mind. but uh, yeah. that wasn't the case. I think you got the three songs in before you took it off last night. Also, the biggest cheer of the night last night was not for one of their multiple hits. It was for the mention of a spice bag. He said they had a couple of pints in Temple Bar and went for a spice bag, which got a humongous roar around Croke Park. I've, I've been to many uh, a big occasion in Croke Park, and Mick Jagger saying the word spice bag is the biggest cheer I've ever heard mm. in Croke Park. Dublin winning in All-Ireland, not as big. Tyrone winning in All-Ireland, not as big. None of the Kerry All-Irelands uh, match it. Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones, not on a level to Mick Jagger saying spice bag. <laughs> <laughs> that's all he is, just saying spice bag and that's it. The you biggest wonder how, how, he, uh, how he and a spice bag uh, came to be as one, wouldn't you? Well, like, I, I, like what happens there? Is he just like having a chat with somebody down the Foggy Jew and they just say, oh, listen, here, people get an old spice bag into you, Mick. Yeah, I don't know, people seem confused by, uh, by this, but like, let's not forget that he is very familiar with our country. I mean, he's done his homework to this point. He's not here sipping Guinness and going to whatever, the Guinness storehouse. I mean, he's been here so many times. He spent a lot of time in his uh, wild youth down in Wicklow in, in the Guinness estate uh, that he, he's well accustomed to our, to our country, you know. He's been here quite a bit. Guinness so, estate, it, I mean, is there a lot of spice bags down the Guinness estate? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. There was, there was certainly <laughs> other uh, substances down there, I'd say, during the heyday of the Guinness estate. Uh, and the heyday of the Rolling Stones. What are saying, on? Uh, but so he's he's at eleven now, where he's like, "What's the next step?" Yeah, eating a spice bag. That's how you become go, uh, go 2018 to the, go Irish. Go to the cricket. I mean, that's a hugely significant cultural Irish cultural thing to do. Uh, go to Crow Park. That's a pretty like, Irish significant cultural thing to do. And then have a spice bag. Yeah, basically. I mean, uh, golden triangle right there. Yeah, I wonder if he uh, he's going to hang around for any of the the hurling leagues at the weekend or the championship round robin. I should say. Yeah, yeah. he's he's big big Dublin fan. Obviously, yeah. that was the one thing last night that sort of. I mean, it's such a legendary band, you know, you pay a significant part of your ticket prices to go in and see Jagger sort of strolling stuff around the stage, and it was the old, um, how are we doing Dublin? Hello Dublin! It's like, oh, it just feels a bit cliche, doesn't it? For Why are the Stones doing that? Yeah, I was a bit disappointed that he didn't come on stage and say, wasn't Stephen Mollis screwed over, lads? <laughs> like, if he, had, if he had opened with that, then like that would have been spice lag, uh, spice bag pushed to uh, the next level. <laughs> Uh, right, here's what's coming up between now and uh, 9 o'clock or probably just a little bit afterward. after that. We're going to get stuck into the back pages, uh, let you know what's going on in the world of sport uh, this morning. We're going to do that uh, very shortly indeed. Sean Kavanagh has been sitting down in the company of our own, uh, own Shane yesterday. It was pre-hangover yesterday, so he was in uh, top notch and uh, some good stuff there to come your way uh, shortly. Uh, also, Kevin Caban uh, was also at the Rolling Stones last night, so whether he is actually going to join us at 25 past 8 or not, uh, still up for grabs, but we'll hopefully be chatting to him 
and about 45 minutes thereabouts and uh, we're going to talk a bit about Leinster Munster too and Alan Quinlan is going to join us in studio to do just that and Owen Redden will be on the line as well so all of that good stuff coming your way between now and 9 o'clock keep your comments coming into us on the hashtag OTBAM or uh, if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you get us do subscribe because that way uh, every time we are live and we have a whole bunch of shows coming your way uh, even later today we have what is I think round two of our brand new hurling show and that is coming your way uh, from half twelve Tommy is that saying about half twelve yeah that's it Shane Stapleton in the company of Michael Verney so that's coming your way a bit later on but plenty before that and we're going to OTB AM in association with air get air sport free with air broadband yeah there we go that's the way it works on when you're a bit sort of sticky after the Rolling Stones that's, that's the way things go sticky yeah I've, I've, I've never heard anybody describe the hangover like that but let's roll with it <laughs> uh, the Irish Independent back page this morning it's dominated you can see by a uh, pretty jubilant Sam Bennett there if some writers didn't know who he was they certainly do know is the uh, quote here from Nicholas Roach after Sam Bennett's win at the uh, Giro d'Italia yesterday on stage 12 his second uh, win of the uh, Giro Galway cash in with new 2 million euro deal is the other story here uh, Supermax are extending their agreement for 5 more years to reflect intercounty progression and as Colm Keyes writes it uh, puts them up on the same general kind of a scale as Dublin and Cork it's about half Dublin's uh, sponsorship fee that they're going to get over the next 5 years but that's pretty good that they're uh, What's, does he sign a figure there? yeah it's uh, 400,000 a year 2 million over 5 years so just a tad below Cork I think Chill is a 420,000 a year is that what it is yes, yeah just and Dublin is 800,000 so it's is that what it is yeah. because they were saying 1 million uh, in recent weeks when the AIG partnership was announced but they didn't have exact figures but Colin Keyes obviously has you uh, know what you could be right I think that was actually 800,000 in the previous deal so right, you okay. could well be right we've yeah. yet to see an official figure on the AIG deal it's just yeah. uh, sources say yeah. that it's in and around 1 million and it's always an unfair comparison as well because you're never going to get any county that's going to get anywhere close to that kind of a figure um, so that is uh, the story with Galway huge blow for Westmeads as vice captain departs for the US this is a story that uh James Dolan is on his way to Boston and like it's 11 days out from Westmead playing Leash in the Leicester Championship. I think it's absolute bullshit that at that point you would decide that having been through the league and uh, all the other tournaments that 11 days out a uh, position like the vice captain decides that's it, I'm done, I'm off, I'm out of here because they don't any longer have the option to sort of play a couple of rounds, see how, how Westmead go in Leicester and then um, piss off to the US. Yeah, does it say whether or not he'd made this decision earlier on? Like, I mean, does it does it harm the camp to have him around the, the squad yeah. for, the, for the last couple of weeks, even if he's going to decide to go, you think yeah. it does? Yeah, yeah. What's he doing hanging around? What's he doing playing in the league, taking up somebody's position who is ultimately going to have to play in the championship? Like, communicate that to the team, to the management team, at the start, at the start of the, either decide you're in at the start of the year or decide you're out. Yeah, um, but like, there is also the scope to change your mind. Like not 11 days out from the championship. Like that is why such not? a rash I mean, decision. it's the start of the summer. I mean, the, the opportunities to pick up work in the summer in, in the United because States increase. you've spent the last five, five months uh, building away into this championship that you've uh, made sacrifices for, presumably, in terms of your fitness regime, nutrition, your lifestyle, all of that sort of stuff, your commitment to the team. You're also the vice captain of the team. And then, so you're the one who should be setting the example, saying this is how we should eat, this is how we should train, this is how we should behave. And then 11 days out from the most important game of the season, you're saying, I'm out of here. But that's on him. I mean, that's his own decision. I mean, all the sacrifices he's made... Like, it's, bull it's a bullshit decision. It's, it's, it also it, impacts the team, though. It, okay, if you park that for a moment, though, I mean, who, if, we, if we believe like all the sacrifice, all, all this stuff that he's put to one side mm. to become vice-captain for Westmeath mm. for the first five months of the year, like, he, he's well within his rights to make that decision. He's well within his rights to say, listen, I've sacrificed a lot, but do you know what? It'd be better for me to go to the United States this summer. It's better for me. And do you know what? All those sacrifices were for me in the end. I was the one who was giving up the most. And of course the team is going to be he diminished because he's that. vice captain. He should have done that five months ago. But he didn't know that he didn't know that the opportunity was going to go there. I mean, I, people can change their minds. I mean, like, just think, would uh, you have had a problem with it if he did it last month? Probably not. Eleven days out is prob a bit probably, tight. Probably less so. But eleven days out, as I'm saying, like even in the league, like the Westmead management team would want to prepare their team to uh, take on Leash in the first round of Leinster, with generally with the team that they're they're trying to work towards a first fifteen, and he's obviously taking up somebody's spot. Who? Uh, you What's know. your opinion on Brendan Murphy? Was there some slight different? Uh, uh, He's a leader in the he had, team. He had made it known. Murphy had made it known to management earlier in the season. So at least management at that point. 
get to decide, well, we, we think we value the players that we're actually going to put you in anyway because we need to get some results in the league, but we understand that you're going afterwards. Whereas it seems, I mean, it doesn't have the full story. It doesn't have any quotes from the guy himself, but it seems like 11 days out he's saying, that's it, I'm done. Well, that's what he has said. I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem like that, but I think that's what the story is. And I, had, well, I don't, well, I don't we, particularly well, have any we, problem with that. We, we don't know, because we don't know exactly what the story is, right? Because there isn't any quotes from him. But So you're just trying to read between the lines of whatever Colin Keyes is saying. So worst case scenario here is he's uh, rocked up the training two nights ago and yeah. said, listen, uh, I'm going to the United States yeah. in whatever, two weeks. Okay, I can see where you're coming from. In terms, if mean, you're a professional athlete, it's a... It's a bit of a, a bad thing to do, but he's not a professional athlete, he's an amateur, he needs to think uh, about his own career, he needs to think about whatever opportunities may lie for him this summer on a professional level, and if I was a good team luck out, to him. If I was a team out of his 11 days out, I'd be saying, dude, that's not on. Sexton losing a uh, fitness race to face Munster is the other story here in the Irish Independent. That's by uh, Rory O'Connor, which was uh, somewhat surprising, and also he's saying that uh, maybe Ross Byrne is going to be the player that gets the nod. Uh, to start, and not Joey Carberry. So we'll get to the thoughts of Alan Quinlan and Owen Redden on that uh, in a little bit. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of the newspapers this morning have not really had a huge amount of coverage of the Leinster Munster game, which is a bit surprising for me, but the Irish Times is not one of those. As you can see, uh, Big Victor and Mick Galway going at it there. Uh, Leinster and Munster set to add to the history of a friendly violence. So it's uh, really all about the Leinster Munster game here. And the Irish Times, uh, Liam Toland as well. Munster can prevail if they emotionally drain Leinster. Are uh, his thoughts today? Carberry at fifteen is the uh, thought as well. Uh, at the bottom of this piece here, in terms of the uh, team news, that uh, Joey Carberry is going to come in instead of Rob Carney. So that is uh, the way the Irish Times see it shaking up. Lots on the uh, cycling as well. On uh, Bennett Powers home to win his second stage. This is um, a guy from Carrick and Shore uh, reading some of the reports. I didn't see the stage yesterday, but reading some of the reports, Sean Kelly, um, who would have been his mentor, obviously from the same neck of the woods has stood up in the commentary box and mm. to acclaim uh, his fellow townman uh, coming over the line. Yeah, exactly. On Eurosport, the, the commentator says, Sean Kelly is standing up beside me. A great day for the Irish. Sean Kelly is the last person to win multiple stages on a Grand Tour. That would have been in 1988 on the Vuelta. And this has been coming a long time for Sam Bennett. Like He's been in and around the Giro last year. I think he came second in one stage. I think he had a hat-trick of third places as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken in that, in the Giro last year. Like obviously last year then, he doesn't actually partake in the Tour de France. I think that was a team directive that was like, right Sam, go gung-ho on the Giro, obviously partaking in a big team. Go gung-ho on the Giro, you can take the Tour off and you can come back for the Vuelta. And I think that's how it worked out. Had he been the Lantern Rouge in the Tour de France the previous season, was that the right? The previous season, like I think it was... The last finisher. So 2016, yeah, the previous season, yeah. 2016 he was uh, Lantern Rouge. Like he did have... A severe injury, I think, to his hand. I think he had a broken hand, and he didn't realise till after he got back to Paris. Of right. course, a broken hand isn't the most severe injury you could have as a cyclist oh, and all that. But yeah. the, pre the previous year then was his first year cycling the Tour de France. He abandoned. He was urinating blood. He had a pretty hard time. It was Paul Kimmage levels of just disaster, really, uh, when things go badly wrong in, in the Tour de France. And like when you look at a cyclist like Sam Bennett, because he's a sprinter your heart really goes out to a lot of them when it comes to the Tour de France, when it's like, right, they're going for the point stage on, on the flat, or they're going for the points uh, on the flat uh, part of the stage, I should say, and then when they go up Alpe d'Huez, they're absolutely dying, and it's like, I've already put in all my effort, and I still have to go up uh, through a whole category uh, climb here, and they're always the guys lagging, lagging at the back. The Lantern Rouge quite often goes to a sprinter because they have to make it home to make sure they get their points and all that sort of stuff. This guy has been talked about for a long time. I mean, he, because he's been on, on the scene for, whatever, seven, eight years, people are saying Sam Bennett is going to come good. He's, he's talked about abroad as a guy who's like, we've got a good Irish sprinter coming at home. And, I mean, it's great to have an Irish sprinter. When you watch the Tour de France, you're like, it's, it's great to have Dan Martin involved in the GC always. But you always think to yourself, it'd be kind of cool to have a sprinter because it's unbelievably exciting stuff. When you look at what happened last year with, like Michael Matthews, I think, took the green jersey uh, home from the Tour de France. Uh, like you look at the likes of Marcel Kittel, you look at uh, Peter Sagan, obviously he got disqualified from the Tour de France last year. This guy can probably mix it with them uh, at certain occasions. Whether or not he can do it in France now is a different question. And I presume he's going to cycle in France this year. So it's very, very exciting yeah, time for Sam. Too. Leave him out, wouldn't it, after winning two uh, stages this year, or then to say, right, dude, that's it, good luck to you. Yeah, exactly, but at the same time, it is a huge effort. Um, yeah, so he's he's second at the moment in the Red Jersey uh, quest. There's Peter Sagan there, congratulations on your second stage win at the Giro d'Italia. You'd like to think that the two, these two guys could become big rivals, that'd be a big... A uh, big statement for Bennett, if he could become a big rival of Sagan. Sagan obviously will be going after that green jersey this year after what happened last year, big time. 
Um, so yeah, it's a, it's exciting times for him, and like as I say, it's a bloody exciting thing to have an Irish person well involved with because it's they're thrilling finishes. Yesterday was a thrilling finish. Mm. You watched it. Yeah, I watched it back. Well, I watched it back. Okay. Didn't watch it live. I mean, drunk from the Rolling Stones at sort of two o'clock in the morning. There's nothing better to do than throw on a bit of cycling when uh, when you're coming back spice after a few bag pints. Spice uh, bag and and Eurosport. Spice bag and Sean Kelly. Yep. What is a spice bag? Oh my God, you're not serious. Yeah. We we need to we need to have a sit down here and explain to you what a spice bag is. So sp a spice bag is something you, you would get from a, a Chinese or a chipper. I mean, the, a, a, multi a multitude of fast food restaurants do them, and it's uh, you've got your spices, obviously, which is the main part. But they would go on top of chips. What sort cut of spices? Up, cut up. Oh, wow. Okay. Now that's a very complex question. <laughs> would you it, don't have an answer? You're, you're going to have to ask Mick, Mick Jagger right. uh, for that answer. It's, it's basically I mean, chicken chips, uh, like peppers, and some sort of and spicy all spiced shit. up. Oh, yeah. There we go. There, exactly. That's Jesus. that looks like almost a gourmet spice bag. Oh, really? you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get that in North. Fi Dublin. It looks fiery. Is it fiery? Uh, what do you mean by fiery? Like spicy hot, hot. Well, it is called a spice bag. No, but is it like hot, hot? It's not like it is quite hot. I mean, like they're, they're, these are very kind of posh spice bags. These I mean, are these are Tommy. Tommy. This is D four spice bags. This is the sort of spice bag Tommy would have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. That's good, actually. To be fair, you should you should try it. I'm not sure about the curry s side on it. To be quite honest. Well, you wouldn't normally have. But, yeah, like I mean, it's become it's becomes oh, good. it's become such a part of the vernacular now in uh, the youth of Ireland that if you say to somebody, "What are you having?" A spice bag, a spice box, spicy right, box. Okay. Um, if you say to somebody uh, of a certain age in Ireland now, "Do you want to spice it up tonight?" It's like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> go have some spice bag." Move on. Just gone eight o'clock on this Friday morning. The Irish Examiner. Uh, we've got a pretty cool picture of uh, Paul McGinley and uh, Goat. Um, there at La Hinch, as La Hinch toast McGinley for securing 2019 Irish Open date. We brought you this news uh, yesterday on the show. Uh, Nathan Murphy had a special with Paul McGinley. You can check that out uh, on offtheball.com. Um, and yeah, some other stuff there going on about uh, Offaly football, Sam Bennett, and Ronald Gareth's piece. And so I've been really surprised by uh, the front page of the Irish Examiner this morning and by the only piece that uh, talks about the a preview of the game is Brendan O'Brien uh, inside all the rest of it, including Ronald Agar's piece, which is a look back at last weekend. There's nothing really too much in there. I kind of expected that the examiner would have been sort of wall-to-wall -wall Leinster Munster. Yeah, it's not just the examiner though, is it? I mean, uh, obviously, yeah. like, obviously it's like the, the examiner given its um, cork base and all that, like whenever it's a big game for Munster, they, they often lead with Ronan O'Gara, even on a, just a regular Pro yeah. 14 weekend or, or a pool weekend in the Champions he, Cup. He just hardly mentions the Leinster Munster That's game. the thing, it's, it's clearly... It's clearly yet to capture the full imagination. The pro mm. Maybe if it was a final, it'd be very different. Uh, maybe. Vinnie Jones, Owen, you'll be very excited to hear Vinnie Jones. Um, Vinnie Murphy. <laughs> Vin wow. <laughs> the Vinnie Jones will be all other. I was uh, like, what is the Vinnie Jones story? Really similar kind of characters. Vinnie Murphy um, is on his way to Offaly, according to Paul Keane. Uh, the Irish Daily Mail this morning, that is the report there. The St. Peregrine's coach. Uh, is about to take over from the troubled Offaly footballers. And McCarthy vows the other uh, feature interview here by Ian Ladyman in the Irish Daily Mail, uh, Mail this morning. Mick insists he'll still cut it as boss in the Premier League. He's essentially saying that uh, his good pal Neil Warner can cut it, so why the hell can't I? He's uh, only 59, actually, which was a bit of a mild surprise for me. Uh, nearing a 1,000 games as a manager. No plans to retire. Wants to work in the Championship at the Premier League. Says he could get in at a good Championship club with a shot at the Premier League. And uh, thinks he still has a job that he can do. It's not like Tesco or Esso, he says, Owen. You, can send you, you uh, can't just send your CV off. Uh, you look like praying mantis, waiting for someone else to get the sack or leave. Divorced, beheaded, died. That's is brilliant. Direct quote there Gotta love Mick McCarthy. He's a great interviewee. He, he just... is. It's not a, not a phenomenal read. I've been through it this morning. It's a good read because it's Mick Nick. McCarthy, but... It's a, it's a good read, not a great read. Oh, I think is the. Uh, I'll take that though. I mean, I, I'll, I'll read a good read on a, on a Friday morning anyway. Uh, Racing post finally for me. Hancock uh, goes all in on a FOBTs. This is the um, fixed bet uh, terminal betting that they've reduced from hundred pounds maximum stake to two pounds. I'd been listening to something yesterday. They were saying that you could put down hundred pounds every. I think it was either every twenty seconds or every thirty seconds. They've reduced that now, to, which would seem to me to be a, um, um, the government taking the industry seriously, which seems to be a good thing to do, uh, down to just two pounds. That's the uh, Racing Post this morning. And some other uh, stuff in the back. Rafa Benitez on his way to West Ham and some other nonsense about League Two. Mm. Uh, just on the betting things, I was uh, 
listening to a, a podcast from the States the other day and they were talking about obviously the, the new gambling laws that have come in or are about to come in in different states in the US pretty much uh, nationwide yeah. and uh, they were talking about going to the 2012 Olympics and they were like I was over in London and they had all these booths where you could just walk in and place a bet and walk out mm. that it just it is bizarre that you would even think that the whole idea of a bookies that is a, a legal thing where you walk in have a transaction and walk out uh, it's such an alien thing to them so it does drive a lot. It, I mean it still exists in the US right it's just that it gets driven underground yeah very much so yeah, um, yeah so there'll, there'll be more on that uh, I'm sure in the papers when that thing when the legalization does come in over the next couple of months but anyway moving on moving back to the football at the front page of the Herald Sports section this morning uh, says it was one of the great cup goals as Manchester United prepare to face Chelsea in tomorrow's FA Cup final Old Trafford legend Kevin Moran talks to Eamon Carr about the famous final of 1985 uh, it is football as well on the back of the mirror this morning Pep the £60 million man City make him highest paid manager in the world no wonder he's happy and excited You've also got Arsene anoints Arteta. Arsene Wenger believes Mikel Arteta has all the qualities to be his successor as Arsenal manager. He was very reluctant to actually anoint Mikel Arteta. I think they were referring to his quotes in Wenger. The Guardian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think pretty fulsome in his praise. Didn't fulsome quite in his say, praise, yeah. but he did also say, when I'm going to say this, you are going to report this as uh, Wenger backs Arteta. I don't want that to be the case because I don't want me to be influencing decisions at yeah, Arsenal Football Club. He isn't involved in it. Exactly, but I do believe he has all the qualities. So, lo and behold, the mirror takes the Guardian's quotes and say Arsenal anoints uh, <laughs> Arteta, so uh, Wenger sees the future there. Good choice, um, I think, actually. But, yeah. I presume it is from uh, the Guardian because he does use the exact same words in the Guardian and on the back of the star this morning it says, the chosen gun, Wenger tips Arteta for Arsenal job again. I don't think Wenger was uh, going out of his way to push Arteta to the front, but he does rate him very highly as a coach. You've also got Blues will cont cost. That's uh, ahead of the FA Cup final tomorrow. Pep extends Etihad's day as well, and awfully line up Murphy. Uh, it's an exclusive, they say here, but it's obviously been carried in a couple of other places. Vinnie Murphy looks to be in the driving seat to take over awfully for the rest of the championship summer. We'll Pep on the gas. Champions will get even better, reads the back of the sun. That's the new deal for Pep Guardiola. Uh, the cycle of his life, you've got Sam Bennett there as well after his stage win at the Giro d'Italia. Henri and Gunnar's talk now is an exclusive by Martin Lipton here. Arsenal's top brass want to meet Thierry Henri and discuss the manager's job. From an Arsenal perspective, please do not do that thing. Do not talk to Thierry Henry. He would not make a good manager. A who, joke, on earth would, who on earth would think? Is that a joke? Is that a bit of a paper seller? Well, it's Martin Lipton. I'm sure his sources are very, very good. He, he's got very well-placed London sources. He always has. Um, I, I, I mean, I would struggle to see the evidence for that one. But, I mean, he's also on, like, is it six million quid a year with Sky, something like that? Four, is it? Is it six? Um, Whatever it is, it's an easy gig. Yeah, like, I mean, it could be one of these token gestures from Arsenal like they did with Vieira last week, saying, oh, would you be interested? We, we can give you a, a formal think, interview. Yeah, they spoke with Vieira on the phone, was that it? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Hopefully it's the same thing with Thierry Henry. Thierry Henry would be a terrible manager. Let's let's call a spade a spade here. Who knows, though, but the, the genius of Roberto Martinez might have rubbed off on him in Belgium. And we, like the next step is to dance at a Jason Derulo concert and then become a good manager. That's how uh, uh, that Thierry works. Henry's career has to go. Uh, th these are the Arsene Wenger uh, quotes we were talking about. The question is, do I still want to coach? Do I still want to suffer? It's a great quote there from him. He's been speaking to The Guardian this morning. Uh, and abuse payout. Chelsea settled case with alleged victim. Uh, this is Daniel, story, uh, Daniel Taylor and Martin Kellner's story here. Uh, Chelsea becoming the first football club to issue a payout to an alleged victim since the full extent of football sex abuse scandal was, was exposed, uh, but risk drawing criticism for not making the compensation deal public, so we don't know exactly how much uh, has been dished out. Chelsea have previously been condemned for paying 50 grand to another former player, Carrie Johnson, in effect to buy his silence. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not that sum will be disclosed uh, to, the, to the victim of abuse there at Chelsea Football Club. Um, Daniel Taylor obviously doing brilliant work on that story and more to come from The Guardian, I'm sure, over the next couple of weeks. Arteta on the brink, says the front of the Daily Telegraph sports section. Spaniard set to become Arsenal manager with Wenger's blessing. Uh, that's probably kind of more uh, the angle on what Wenger was actually trying to say. I think deep down he believes that, Ar that Mikel Arteta is in the driving seat. It looks like he's going to become Arsenal manager. It's a pretty good, good choice. Guy's got exposure to top-level coaches, highest level in the game. Seems like a very natural step for him. And Arsenal have obviously never really been about sort of appointing um, the biggest names in, in world football to the uh, manager position. So I think it's a good choice. Yeah, it seems that way. I think uh, I think all of us have kind of gone on a journey of opinion on Mikel Arteta over the past five days or so because it's just been good reference after good reference after good reference yeah. from Pep to Wenger to former players that he's played with that he is uh, a very, very bright football mind. So hopefully it works out well for him.
Good stuff. All right, lots uh, to come. We're going to talk to Kevin Caban in a little bit about all the weekend's uh, football as well as a couple of other bits of bobs as well. Alan Quinlan is going to join us in the studio and we'll speak to Owen Redden too to preview that uh, Leinster-Munster game in the Pro 14 semi-final. So all of that good stuff to come. But in the meantime, Sean Kavanagh dropped into the studio during the week. He spoke to Owen. Uh, he was speaking as part of Electric Ireland's This Is Major campaign launch, uh, which supports its sponsorship of the GEA Minor Championships. Four major GEA legends, Sean Kavanagh, Ollie Canning, Mick Fenley, uh, Daniel Goulding, have uh, teamed up to form the Electric Ireland Minor Star Awards judging panel. They'll shortlist the Minor Player of the Week nominations for both hurling and football throughout the championships. And here's how Sean's chat with Owen went. All right, I'm delighted to say we've got Tyrone legend Sean Kavanagh in studio with us. Sean, you're very welcome. Okay. Uh, you must be sick of standing in front of a camera at this point. I mean, your punditry career off to a flyer at the weekend. I'm getting used to it. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> so sure of it off to a flyer, but yeah, learning the ropes and, and, and seeing, the other, seeing the other side for a long time when you're as a county player and, and looking to, to, to pundits. You, you you can get very easily frustrated. You can get very easily offended, and mm -hmm. and, and you can see how that that, that can happen. Um, but when you're a player, you're in that bubble. You're not always thinking holistically. You're not always thinking. You know, it, it, you, you become very protective of, of you, your your teammates, and yourself. So I'm seeing that other side now, and starting to enjoy seeing the other side because it, it does it does give you a different perspective on on where things are at. Were you nervous on Sunday evening? Okay, you do. You, I, I think. I think the biggest thing is is trying to ensure that you give everyone a fair trial, and and you and you you don't want to. I suppose at, at the early stages where I'm at, I, I, I don't. I don't want to. I, I, I want to ensure things are pointed out about even some of the lesser teams, so-called lesser teams, um, and 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 you want to be fair to everyone. And whenever there's so many games to analyse, whenever there's five or six games that are coming in, and, and you're only, you know, you're not always getting the time to completely go through the game from start to finish. You, whenever you have four or five games analysed and you have three hours to do it, mm. you're, you're flicking through. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm conscious coming from a player's environment myself that you want to ensure what's important is highlighted. Um, but when you're under time constraints, it's not always possible. Of course, yeah. Like, like we've spoken to a lot of people about how it works in the BBC with Match of the Day because a lot of their pundits will be on the show, like Kevin Kilban, obviously, is, is part of the team here. So what's that process like of actually trying to dig into to the meaty parts and to kind of, I suppose, the, the main narratives from different games that you mightn't have seen in full at the weekend? I presume there's a team of researchers there helping you. Yeah, and, and, and you're, you're reliant on, on, on their capabilities. And, and I have to say, you know, the, the guys are... They're well versed in it, and they know what they're looking for. But at the same time, when 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 you have a specific angle yourself that you want to highlight, you, you need to see that, and and you need to see that trend. So the guys will come and say the game went this this way, and and and, and you'll get to see some of the key highlights for sure um, of of some of the games that you haven't watched live. But at the same time, I, I, I'm quite anal anal analytical by, by nature, I'm an accountant, and I, I, I would then go back and say, no, well, I, I need to see more of that, I'm not just going to take your word for it, that that, that was a, a theme of play, that that guy was, was winning his battle or, or whatever. I, 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 so quite often, on, 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 particularly on Sunday, I, I was asking for more detail. Mm -hmm. I says, I, I, need, I, I need to see this a little bit more for myself with, with my eyes before I can, I can speak about it. So uh, I think that, that end of it will, 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 be, will be quite tricky because I'm, I, I'm a stats guy. I can remember as a, as a child, um, going through every stat and, and every, every report on soccer reports that you used to get in, in papers. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll be seeing who scored in the Division 3 games in late Nor late, late Orient and Scunthorpe and, and how they played. And say, I, have, I have a real visual memory for, that, for those details. So uh, naturally, I want to see that with, with GA and, and, and the games that I'm, I'm analysing and talking about. But uh, quite often, when you're under that time constraint, you, you know you're flicking over reports and you're trying to see who scored from play and who did this and who did that and where he was playing. And uh, I, th I think that's that's a one bit that that I, I you know I will uh, I will certainly learn uh, a, a technique of being able to do that quite quickly. So, was there any particular reason why it was the likes of Leighton Orient that you were reading as a kid? Was it just <laughs> no, no? I, I was just I, as, as a person, I'm just quite obsessive about unless maybe the accountant and me, I'm quite obsessive about numbers, about facts. Um, and 
uh, as, as well as that, you know, you have to combine that with, with styles. And uh, as a player then who has played the game from 2001, 16, 16 years later, um, you, you do try and combine that with, with, with what's important in terms of the, the trends of the way a team was playing, the way an individual was being utilised, who he's up against, um, and, and all that. So there, there's, a, there's a, a, a jigsaw puzzle to put together there, but I think I'm going to enjoy that side of things, of, of trying to do that, because it's something that if I was sitting at home, I'd be trying to do anyway. Yeah, so you, you've obviously got a, a very analytical mind, as you pointed out yourself, but... Presumably everybody who's an ex-player has a very competitive mind as well and they want to do the best job possible. They want their pundit punditry to be as good as how they were on the field. And you see that quite a lot uh, in Monday Night Football and Sky Sports, for example. Gary Neville is clearly a perfectionist. He wanted to take Sky Sports to the next level. Like, Do you view your punditry as kind of something that you could be uh, competitive with, I guess, uh, d- d- down the line? I think you do see that and I'm starting to see that in, in even the, the very short time that I've been involved. That. Uh, at times, it's hardly a word as well. Everyone's vying for our time, mm. and uh, the likes of uh, Des Cal and Michael Lester and whatnot has to try and referee that. But um, everyone has a number of points that they want to get in in a very short space of time, and it's hard. You can see people's frustration at times at, at maybe some of the so-called lesser counties don't get enough air time but that, that, that's, that's tricky because uh, we, we, with, with everything in the production there, there is uh, everything is limited to to minutes and seconds um, so the weighting of those and, and, and then trying me as a pundit trying to get every I, I've maybe a, a list of 30 or 40 points that I would like to make um, but you only get three or four of those done so sometimes you come off thinking God, I, I should have said X I should have said Y so it, it is competitive, and you can see that sometimes, in, in some people's uh, uh, egos, egos take over. And and but I don't want to. I, I am competitive, but I I, I always want to be fair. Uh, I think I'm I'm, I'm going to try and take the approach that as long as I'm true to myself and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying not to be too personal, you have to remember the GA is is amateur. Mm. I, I've sat there on a Sunday night, being run down myself as a player and then having to get up on Monday morning, go to work, take phone calls about that and that's not easy either. Is there anybody you're sharing a corridor with down in Montrose at the moment who would have been giving you a rundown at the weekend? That's uh, okay, look, well, look, there's, uh, yeah, like, you do tend to remember um, things that, that people say about you. Um, Is there anything I was I was on with Kieran Whelan the other day, and I, 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 I didn't happen to say it to him, but I think I will at some point. I remember him uh, a couple of years ago mentioning about about me diving in, in, in a championship game in Croke Park, and I remember thinking, I I marked you, and you know you know I'm not that type of player, and uh, you know you. you but as, as a player, you are very sensitive and you're very protective, and mm. you could see that that. Um, I was on a couple of weeks ago and I, I put in a super late prediction and I didn't include Mayo because I thought Galway would, would beat them last Sunday and I, I, I thought... You could be right. I could, I could have been right, I, I may not. and I, I don't know how, how they're going to fare in the qualifiers but I was, uh, the, the, my mind was thinking their age profile of their squad, uh, if, if they catch a throne or Monaghan, it, it could be a tough, tough early round game. Uh, but all of a sudden, you, you open your Twitter and you open your, um, you, you're seeing floods of matches, thinking uh, Sean Cavan is best or Sean Cavan has got something against us, and I'm thinking <laughs> nothing against anyone. I'm just trying to, you know, there's 25 other teams that I I didn't include that I didn't seem to bother all that much. So um, you do realise how sensitive people take things, and I do have to remember I, I was I was like that myself. I was quite convinced at times that there was an agenda against her own or agenda against me and um, when you're in that wee bowl of, of playing for your team not, you know you, you do tend to be convinced that people are out to get you. For sure. Uh, do you think you're going to find it difficult to if the opportunity presents itself and Tyrone needs to be rightfully bashed or something, not that that'll, that will happen this summer, but maybe bash is the wrong word. If you have to critique this Tyrone team quite in quite a harsh manner, are you going to find it hard to do that? It's not just because of former teammates, like your own brothers in, in the squad, you, yeah. you will feel a, a connection there. <laughs> There's a connection there, but I don't, I, I don't think that will be an issue. Um, I... Because I've been playing for so long, I, there, there, there's probably been four or five different teams that I've played with. So it's not as if I've any unbelievably close connection with the most recent team of last year or the year before. Um, I, 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 I think I, I don't. 
I hope I don't go down the the personal insult way. I I, I don't want to be that type of person, um, and I don't think I am that type of person. But I, I think you know if I if I can be objective about a team's performance, uh, I'll have no problem uh, saying that. And it's easier if, if it is your brother. I think I could run Colin down <laughs> a bit easier than anyone else. So uh, I think he's used to that. By now. Yeah, you can pretty much clear the air straight away with him with a quick phone call afterwards. Um, like in your defence, like you have tweeted already earlier in the year when it was Tyrone Monaghan, I think in the league saying this Tyrone team is so much more potential than what they showed uh, last night and I think it's fitting that we're here given the week it is because they're playing each other again this year like do you fear for Tyrone going into the summer that they might not show the potential they have in an attacking perspective or do you feel that that was just kind of a little bit of feeling them themselves around the pitch during the league it's it's hard to say where Tyrone Armand are really at at the moment but I think everyone knows that they are within the top eight or top six but I, th I think Sunday will, will, a bit like the Galway-Mayo game last Sunday, Sunday will really tell us whether they are, are, are capable of pushing on that, that little bit more. And I think most people recognise at, at Tyrone and, and the game we had with Dublin last, last summer uh, pinpointed that if, if we are to kick on the next level, we need that, that attack and prowess. Dublin do it so well. Dublin drop players back when they need to drop players back and they will attack ferociously whenever they need to do that. So Dublin have that adapt adaptability within their team at the moment. We were quite simplistic probably in our approach last year, We but ultimately we believed that that was going to be good enough to, to win a, an All-Ireland. I think Mickey and the backroom team will have learned from then and I think it was quite evident to everyone that you're not going to take Dublin down playing a, a one, one style. I think, I think you need to be able to rotate that and that's where the likes of I'm sure Galway and Kerry's of this world are looking about about being able to combine that defensive ability to, to go and, 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 and they have the players in attack and, and Throne I hope is at that level now as well we've unearthed uh, young Lee Brennan has had a, a, a really good really really good league campaign he's a natural finisher you know you throw him on top of the likes of, of a Mark Bradley and, and Niall Sludden and Peter Hart and, and guys of that ilk and, and they will score the big question is is, is whether 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 Mickey is going to put them in a formation that's going to allow them to flourish, and 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 or whether we will resort to Type A, which is probably that 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 similar counter attack game plan that we had for the last number of years. So that's a question that's there. Stephen O'Neill has, has been brought in to probably answer that and to try and 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 put a bit more kick in and, and speed of. Uh, play and or attack but Sunday will tell the tale yeah it'll be very interesting well you've been in Oma many a time for a big championship game enjoy it as a fan and we'll speak to you again soon John Kavanagh thank, thank you very you. much thanks a million yeah so Stephen O'Neill is the uh, Steve Bold to the Arsene Wenger Mickey Hart sort of analogy here that he's been brought in to try and shake things up a small bit I mean it's uh, interesting for Sean Kavanagh that he's so open isn't it to talk about Mickey Hart and be critical of him which to be fair he was as a player as well he was never kind of shy of saying that he always understood that maybe that relationship was there was a tension in that relationship that actually maybe at times got the best out of Tyrone but he doesn't he's not afraid to uh, express his frustration at I mean the 12 point loss obviously uh, back end of last season and all that but um, yeah I mean it's hard to know where Tyrone are going here but yeah. Interesting stuff from Kavanagh. Yeah, like on that point, I see um, Declan Bogan, the Belfast Telegraph last week, was kind of analysing Sean Kavanagh's first punditry outing, which would have been the Sunday Games preview show for the summer, and he said that he was kind of doing the, the nudge and wink kind of vernacular that you would often see with Kerry pundits, for example, and that you wouldn't actually see it that often with pundits in terms of yerraisms. Mm -hmm. uh, but th this is what he suspected actually happened with Sean Cavan at the start, that he's like, ah, playing down to Ron's chances, and I'm on him and have a real chance of winning this game on Sunday. So that's an interesting element. He kind of denied that there, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that he would believe it. I think that Kavanagh probably believes that. Like, as I said, he was quite critical as a player. It wasn't as if he was always uber protective of the bubble that he spoke about there himself that actually at times he was critical of Mickey Hart and the system and the fact that it couldn't there wasn't a plan B and I think that's kind of the question mark now isn't it that he's some, some, a lot of the stuff he's saying is whether Mickey Hart is pliable enough to actually put a system in place that brings the best out of his players or actually I know the way and this is going to be it and we won't deviate from this no matter what happens either over the course of the season or within a game Yeah, I wonder if the player is pliable enough because I, I don't know, chatting to him about the Dublin game a couple of months ago before Moy were in the All-Ireland final, it kind of got the sense that the players were happy to have a plan A and a plan A only against Dublin last year. Of course, it's up to the management team to affect change and the players' mentality, but it seemed that the players were kind of stuck in this one-dimensional train of thought. And I, I guess, to a certain extent, when it comes to 
your psychology before a game, there's nothing wrong with that. Because in his interview with Nathan, he was like, I was convinced we were going to win the All-Ireland. And mm. if you have only one plan and one plan only, it does kind of help feed a school of thought that is like, we are good enough to beat anybody. We don't need another plan. We are, and I guess there's a positive psychology in that. Maybe I'm giving too much credit to, to Mickey Hart Oof, there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's the age-old discussion about whether you should have a plan B or not. But I mean, I think that particularly when you're... When everybody would accept that... Um, maybe a golf is overstretching, but certainly that there's a bit of a gap between Dublin and the rest. Um, you should have something else in your back pocket. Like, if you've got plan A and everybody knows what plan A is than actually trying to surprise a team like Dublin with so anything else. My question would be, what was Jim McGuinness's plan B in 2014? Yeah, maybe I'm not well. sure he had one. Like He says in his book that he had one plan, yeah. and if, Dubl if they were going to beat Dublin on that afternoon, they had to execute this plan to utter perfection. He said he was absolutely obsessive about that. Jim McGuinness. Jim McGuinness. Yeah. That they had to nail this game plan, and they had to execute it perfectly. Mm. Everybody had to play brilliantly. And the amount of preparation that goes into making that a realistic possibility doesn't really allow time to come up with a plan B, particularly in the middle of the season. I mean, you've got to do that in the off-season. Like, I think everybody like, at that level, the Donegal's, the Kerry's, the Tyrone's, the Mayo's, should have a notebook that says Dublin. It's like, if we run into Dublin at any point in the championship, this is our plan. Mm. Like, and that should be your plan to beat them. I, I'm not sure, is it realistic to actually have a plan B going into a game against Dublin, given maybe the, the preparation times and all of that? Because you do have to focus on the minutiae. You do have to focus on getting yeah. everything perfect. Well, and again, I mean, in the context of 2018 and the Super 8s, does like continuous exposure to pl plan A, if that's the only plan, uh, does that even further put it under the microscope? Even uh, the microscope even, even further that uh, like that's our game plan and that's sort of what we're going with and we're going to play that game plan every time we play and that's sort of it. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Like I've got a like that's my theory on Mayo at the moment. Actually, that's we actually haven't seen the real Mayo. That like they're going to be judged on what happened on Sunday and it it was kind of a very loose form of what we've got to know with Mayo and that's doing them a good justice I think I think it was actually miles away from what, the best sort of Mayo game plan that we can see according to some people that there's an element that makes me think that Stephen Rothschild was like there's no need to break out the full game plan here just go out and let him off the leash for a while mm. it, it, part of me doesn't believe that myself even though I've just said that because it was such a huge game but then, like maybe he has the confidence in his players to say, this group of players will get us through to the Super 8s. We're not going to bust out our moves until middle of July. Yeah, I don't know. Because, I mean, that is almost an, some sort of a small acceptance on Stephen Rochard's part, some recess of his brain, either knowingly or not, that actually if we end up getting beaten here, it doesn't really matter. We'll go by the back door and we'll go into the Super 8s and all be well with the world. Like, I, don't I don't know if you willingly actually... I do, you definitely don't willingly choose that route. No, no, but uh, but I, you know. I, I, I think there is credence in the argument that uh, Stephen Rochford sat down and was like, how big a disaster would it be if we lost against Galway at the weekend? And he thought to himself, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Well, it wouldn't be the end of the world, but I don't know that he would ever have sat down and thought... I think that a lot of it... Of I think his thinking would have been dominated by how are we going to beat Galway. And of, course, of course he didn't want to lose the game. Like that's, it's, it's That would be a game. stupid thing to suggest. I think that he said to himself... We have big goals, one particular big goal this summer. May 13 is, can become an important part of that, but it is not the be-all and end-all when it comes to achieving that goal of being there in whatever the 2nd of September, whenever the All-Ireland Football Final is. Mm. And I, 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 don't, I think people are getting a little bit ahead of themselves when it comes to the criticism of the mayor right now. It's funny how every single Gaelic football conversation just rotates all the way back to Mayo again, doesn't it? It does, inevitably, yeah. Even when we plan to talk about hurling. Uh, the FA Cup um, final, obviously, this weekend. Um, five o'clock tomorrow, half five, quarter past five. If five it's one, something. It's certainly one of the three of those. <laughs> um, it's an odd one, isn't it? That like Normally, the FA Cup final is sort of the end of season and it's, you know... 5.15. Um, 5.15, there you go. One of the three. Um, like it's the showpiece aspect to it that you know the ceremonial aspect to it even when the likes of Wigan and stuff are in it it's like this sort of anticipation of the FA Cup final and the pomp and ceremony that comes with it you don't always end up with the most amazing finals but the pomp and ceremony that comes with it you're very much really looking forward to it I, didn't, I haven't really dialed into United Chelsea I have to say I've been, I've been thinking about why 
maybe maybe it's just bypass me. Maybe you're sort of utterly enthused by it, and maybe people generally are utterly enthused by it. But it's bypassed me a small bit, and I don't know if it's partly to do with the fact that like there isn't a huge amount to be. The anticipation levels are not going to be huge about this game, given the nature of the football. Um, particularly United play, it's it's pretty dull stuff. Not a game that you're going to be going. Oh, I can't wait to see the expansive, flowing football mm. that we're going to see in show here. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm t- to be honest, like at what point when you were when you were watching the FA Cup as a kid, everybody's got those memories of watching BBC all day. At what point did you say to yourself, "I'm not going to watch this game because I don't think the brand of football will be good." It's not. I will watch it. It's not even that I won't watch it. It's just the. But you're saying the, the anticipation levels yeah, are down because the, of the brand of football. You know, it's there's an excitement show. about the game I, upcoming, and it's like I don't think so. I, I think because it's United Chelsea. Like these are two big teams. It's like so many little narratives in the background. Mourinho back uh, to take on Chelsea. Mourinho and Conte don't like each other. It might be Conte's last game. The, re- the reason this isn't a big game is because the narrative doesn't involve any sort of recent competitive rivalry. The reason why this game isn't uh, a hugely anticipated one is because Manchester City had the Premier League title wrapped up in February. That's the reason why this game isn't, because yeah. we've basically gone three, four months without really being invested in the upper echelons of English football. It's been done. If Manchester United and Chelsea had been going toe-to-toe for the Premier League title, this would be a continuation of that rivalry, and it's like, right, can't wait for part two of this. Who's going to get the second trophy here? Yeah. I, dull, I can't get past the dull football aspect of it. I think even if that was the I, case, I, I just think it's like. You know. No, I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think that's good enough reason to be quite honest with you, Adrian. I think if if you think it's going to be dull football, well then you know you you, you, you may that's as well you, may as well go pick a, a different league or a, or a different country to watch football from because you're going to get a hell of a lot of dull games that come with its own level of intrigue. And that's not me defending Jose Mourinho's tactics. I don't th- like you like dull football, and that's that is kind of what I'm hearing here. Part of part of it is drawn to me. There is kind of an element. It's like how bad can this get? Is that how, something in the Kerry psyche that sort of? No, of course know, not. We're the absolute sort of embrace the grimness. Is that a really aristocrats of beautiful? Sport. I know, I mean, no, I, I do appreciate that aspect of it, yeah. Yeah, so no, it's. So, uh, overexposure to John B. Keane over a period of time can sort of, I think, do that to one's mind. Be- beautiful on the page, beautiful on the pitch is what I say about uh, Kerry. Yeah, tomorrow, 5 15, as we know, now know, Manchester United against Chelsea. It is going to be a pretty average game. It is not going to be one that we've been waiting for all season because, as I say, it's just not a hugely competitive rivalry when it comes to uh, winning trophies in the context of this season. Um, we're, we're going to. Sorry, I'm slightly distracted. I don't know. I'm just like, um, we're going to talk rugby in just a few minutes' time. Uh, Alan Quinlan's on his way into the studio. He's so pumped about Leinster Munster this weekend. He's outside jostling producer Tommy in the producer's box, giving him the old sort of shoulder and giving him a few digs and trying to get the old get the Munster edge edge on for the weekend. You know, was it was it successful the jostling there? Tommy or? seems pretty um, yeah upset by the whole the whole affair. Uh, so Alan Quinlan on the way very shortly it's uh, 8.34 on this Friday morning delighted to have you with us keep your comments coming into us any thoughts about Leinster Munster this weekend we'd love to hear from you uh, do you think Leinster are going to get it done and complete that double are Munster uh, going to spoil the party in the semi-finals of the Pro 14 so that is upcoming but before that uh, Golf Weekly Ireland's favourite and only uh, golf podcast uh, we're in conversation this week with Paul McGinley he was obviously announcing that the Dubai Duty Free Irish Open in 2019 is going to be held at La Hinch Golf of course, uh, next summer. So that's uh, uh, happening next summer. And he also talked Tiger with Nathan. You were there at Sawgrass. What was your sense of, of where Tiger is now three, four months into this comeback? That was the best I've seen him, Nathan. Um, you know, he got off to a slow start, but again, he dug it out. He didn't miss the cut. He dug it out. He made the cut on the mark. Okay, got a little bit lucky when Speed and Thomas both bogeyed 18 in one of the last groups on on Friday to make the cut. But the way he dug it out the last three or four holes, we followed him on TV that morning. He wasn't on his game, uh, yet he still managed to play powers. He still managed to be conservative, miss it on the right side of the fairways. Um, Control, I mean, that par 5 18 or par 5 ninth hole, the last hole he played, he figured he was on the cut line. He obviously wasn't confident with his game. He blocked it up the rough on the right, right. He laid it up short. He pitched on to 20 feet, nice and conservative, rolled a put down, dead tapped in. He knew what he was doing there. Um, and then he caught fire at the weekend. But what was really interesting about him uh, was when he dropped the shots, he dropped three shots, I think, in the last six holes on, on Sunday. Those who watched it, you know, from 13 in, every single shot he hit was down the flag. And uh, the only thing that was missing was his distance control wasn't quite in. Again, that's adrenaline. That's playing more competitive golf. That's getting the feeling when a ball comes off the club face a little bit quicker. Um, than you normally do because of adrenaline. Now, if anybody knows how to play adrenaline, it's Tiger Woods, and I think that just takes a little bit of adjusting again. But this was the first time that I really saw him when he got in the heat of competition, hitting it down the flag. 
You know, he wasn't afraid to take out the driver and he was, and his iron shot up and raining right down on top of the flag from the 12th hole in. So I think that was a big, big move for, for Tiger last week and I expect him now to get closer and closer to winning. I, for one, am astonished that uh, Golf Weekly were having a conversation about something that had utterly nothing to do with Tiger Woods and uh, somehow managed to shoo on the conversation back in. Is Tiger back? I think they should start talking about this guy Tiger Woods a little bit more on Golf Weekly. I'd like I'd certainly listen to that podcast yeah. if they talked a little bit more about Tiger. Um, yeah, like uh, what what more is there to say now? I mean, we, we, this is this is a phony war of the Tiger back. Is How back is he though? Discussion. How back is he on? Because like, like, is he back a little bit, or well, you know what? Well, I, I to be honest with you, I'm beyond the point of caring at this point uh, about like I'm completely tiger backed out. Yeah. Like it, it is, it, t- tiger back is the hot topic of twenty. You're just like, you're, so you're accepting that he's back. Is that that's where you're no, at? No, because as I say, we're in the phony war now. Nobody nobody knows yet. I mean, people are saying it, it, tiger back is just being in contention. Which is complete bullshit. I mean, that is not what Tiger back is. Tiger back is winning a major, and we don't know. He, he's putting mm-hmm. himself into positions like coming down uh, in the Farmers last weekend, wearing red on the Sunday. I mean, that's is that Tiger back? Of course, it's not Tiger back. Tiger back is winning a major, so we don't know if he's going to win that major or not. So we're here, kind of like twiddling our thumbs for a while, waiting for the actual uh, end discussion. Here, we don't have the answer here. You could be right if you say Tiger's not back. I could be right to say Tiger is back. So here we are. We just go around <laughs> oh, in circles. The Tiger back uh, discussion is completely pointless. If we can't pointless. speculate about what uh, <laughs> shit that goes on is bored. We might yeah, as well just cut this. We've been speculating about whether or not Tiger Woods is back for yeah. 12 months now. Yeah. Oh, I'd say, yeah. I mean, and speculating about whether he would ever come back for many, many years. I love Tiger Woods. I hate the Tiger Woods. Is he back discussion? Mm. Like, Tiger back is such an old take at this point. I was telling you earlier on that I had some uh, clunky analogy to make about the way people yearn for Tiger Woods of yore, that people speak about Tiger Woods as this flawless golfer who never put a foot wrong and they yearn for a day that only existed for a very short period of time because actually Tiger Woods, as everybody knows, his main thing was that he would get him into tr- himself into trouble all the time on the course and managed to get himself out of it um, pretty successfully and do brilliantly and win tournaments and be probably the best golfer that's ever played the game. Um, and that's Tiger Woods, not the guy who would um, never put a foot wrong, sort of hitting 100% of fairways and green Jordan regulation Spieth. and all that sort of stuff. Jordan Speed, like that. Well, that, except that, if you watched the Open last year. Yeah. Anyway. He's, got, he's had his flaws. Um, and so I had some sort of a clunky analogy uh, between that and um, people yearning for the Rolling Stones of yore and sort of, you know, um, how there was a, you know, this, th- th- but, the, but the actual time where they were sort of top of the hit parade and, you know, Absolutely on their game was a very short window until I looked. Where it up is this I going? It up, uh, I said, well, I did start it by saying that I had a clunky analogy to make. Yeah, and as it turns out, an entirely inaccurate analogy because the Rolling Stones, for probably about the best part of thirty years, were sort of banging out number ones, and yeah, yeah, it was, it was an extended period of time before they started just let's keep playing the back catalogue. Yeah, like you do realise you you paid big money to see 74-year-olds uh, rock out Croke Park last night. That would be, uh, according to my calculations, a 60-year career almost right there. So mm. not quite on the same level as Tiger Woods' decade at the top, mm. uh, quite frankly. It's, it's almost six times that. Um, so, yeah, clunky analogy is, is certainly being kind to yourself by, there. By my own admission. You know. uh, like, uh, but at least you're bringing new light to the is Tiger back debate because we need new ideas here. We need fresh thinking. We need to set up kind of a, a committee here and off the ball to come up with new takes on Tiger Woods and whether or not he's back. And your take there to say that he's like the Rolling Stones uh, was complete lunacy, to be quite honest. But at oh, least I, it's fresh thinking, and that's and what we need. I, like, I think it's okay to bring lunacy to the table as long as you're saying up front, listen, this is absolute lunacy. Uh, Gary Lineker copped a bit of heat this week as well um, remember it doesn't matter one jot who you think should have been left out of the squad or who should be in it not one jot it's Gareth Southgate's choice this is why the England squad for the World Cup and uh, he knows them all far better than you carry on he says almost uh, sort of an old Gallagher-esque there at the end um, yeah it's just a sort of reasonable enough point that I don't know well, why it's not really so much, uh, it's not it's not reasonable it not? I don't think that's a reasonable enough point because Gary Lineker is essentially indirect tweeting people on social media saying uh, screw your opinion, stop tweeting. Stop tweeting. Why, why are you giving your opinions about the World Cup uh, squad? I don't a man know. who was so opinionated on Twitter words, I think you're and words who, there. who quote tweets people uh, sending him absolutely vile abuse 
and Lineker's like, oh, all these people who, uh, all these right wingers are, are telling me not to comment on political matters. Mm. That's essentially what Gary Lineker is saying there. He's like, don't comment on the World Cup. I don't spot. think he's saying don't comment. He's just saying don't take yourself too seriously. Your opinion actually doesn't really matter. But look, what's I the think point of that? Reasonable. What's the point of that? Like, I mean, he's like, he, he's he tries so, to target. So what there. happens is, what happens is, you know yourself, so, Gareth, particularly in, in England, Gareth Southgate names a squad. He leaves players out. He leaves Joe Hart out, and everyone. You're going to get a core to people who are outraged about this yes. and quite vitriolic about it. And I think that's probably the tone of, probably, as a guy who, as you just pointed out, does tend to cop a fair bit of stick um, on, on, uh, on Twitter. Um, I think it's sort of fair enough. I, I, think it's just a, I think it's just a completely pointless thing to tweet. Oh, no, I think you've, a, got a, you've got a lot of ang anger issues. I hope this doesn't bubble up later on in the show. I really hope that we are both sort of sitting around this desk when we, when we go off air here just after 9 o'clock or thereabouts, sort of sensing a lot of anger with you this morning. Right, okay, well, that's a, that's a strange thing to say, but... Uh, I hope it doesn't bubble up, that's all I'm saying. Well, I, hope so, I hope so, too, I don't know, what, I don't know what's coming, but, um, yeah, anyway, Gary Lineker, bad take. Um, right, it is 20 to 9 on this Friday morning, keep your comments coming into us, we're going to talk rugby in just a second, we're going to build up to Leinster versus Munster in the company of Alan Quinlan, so we're going to do that in just a minute. But before that, here's Mike Ruddock on the state of club rugby in Ireland, we spoke to him at the Ulster Bank League Awards uh, at the Viva Stadium last night. It's great, you know, I come from a small village in Wales, I grew up, uh, you know, with tribalism and, and, and the importance of representing your village really well and, you know, I see the towns and the clubs of Ireland, you know, carrying on that sort of tradition and being really strong about that and we see it in Gaelic football as well, uh, you know, the parish sort of mentality, if you like, you know, it's really, really important never to let your hometown down and uh, every time we go into battle in this league, it really is about that. It's about um, you know standing up for who you are and what you're about, and um, that's what I love about this league. It's really, really, really good. You talked about like the parish and the parochial nature of the league. What is the uh, the grassroots? What the current state of the club rugby scene, in your opinion? Oh, I think it's very, very healthy. You know, um, look, Irish rugby is on a real high. So when you've got a Grand Slam uh, team like Ireland are, and well deserved as well, uh, with world class players and a world-class coach and then you've got um, Leinster winning the European Cup and you've got two Irish teams in the semi-final uh, of the pro competition as well in the Northern Hemisphere so it's sort of logical to, 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 sort, of, uh, to, to sort of surmise that the, the, the club game is, is going to be pretty healthy as well you know and um, that's, that's how I read it I think the club game is very very healthy and I think the you know the the quality of the teams and the coaches uh, that I certainly have to do battle against a, a, a formidable. When you see the likes of Joey Carberry, uh, Ty Byrne, who was with us a couple of years ago, kicking on Andrew Andrew Porter, uh, who was playing for UCD a couple of seasons ago. See those sort of guys coming through, and you realise it's a it's a great league for developing players as well as trying to develop teams. All right, that's uh, Mike Ruddock at the Ulster Bank League Awards at the Viva Stadium last night. He was in conversation with Sean O'Regan. I'm delighted to say that Alan Quinlan is in studio. Good morning, Alan. Morning. How are you getting on? We, you were down good. at the uh, Viva last night yourself. I was. Yeah, it was nice. It yeah. was um, uh, a good reward for for the club players who've put in a massive effort this season. It's, it was a good season. It was uh, Lanza were fantastic. Uh, Mike Ruddock, success there with his team, and uh, it was a good final, nervy final for them in the end, but uh, they were the best team throughout the year, and um, my old club, Shannon, are promoted as well, so I was pleased Happy with days. that, yeah, they're back in the top flight. Um, so, Leinster Munster, uh, Pro 14 semi-final tomorrow, and um, I was astonished really during the week that Munster had uh, returned 1,000 tickets back from the allocation of about 5,000, they'd said that a bunch of fans had sort of picked up tickets on the general release, but that um, Munster fans, the greatest fans in the world, Gwynny, as we know, have returned yeah. um, a thousand tickets for the game. That's what's going on. I was surprised at that. Um, maybe there's a fear that um, you know, maybe they they may not get the result, and uh, I don't know really what happened. I was surprised with that because it's it's I think it's twenty five percent allocation for 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 Munster and. Um, I'm sure, and I spoke to a lot of people who have bought on the general sale, and, mm. and there were you know people in, living in Dublin here getting the true, getting tickets through the clubs. But uh, surprising, the Edinburgh game wasn't sold out either. They in the the uh, qualifier, whatever it was called, the quarterfinal qualifier, whatever you're having in Thomond Park, wasn't sold out as well. But I presume it's not. Is it? I mean, any sense that it's 
demonstrative of something bigger in terms of the disconnect between Munster No, I don't think so. Look, I think there was issues with uh, people going to the games maybe two years ago when, you know, there was maybe a bit of frustration around some of the results and look, success, and it's the same for any club. If, if you're winning things, it's probably, you know, people turn up more and, and the fans can be a little bit fickle at times that way. But I think it's that time of year as well, Adrian. You know, there's communions, there's confirmations, there's loads of different things on, people travelling up, the financial implication of it. Um, so, yeah, and it was probably the same a couple of weeks ago. I was surprised with that game in Thoman Park that the, sm the crowd was small, but sometimes that can happen this time of year. There's so many fixtures that people have attended throughout the year, um, back to, since last September. So it's uh, financially, it's it's a big hit as well. That one, the quarterfinal was outside your 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 uh, season ticket holders. Right, yeah, okay, so they right. had to you would have to pay separately. And you know, aside from, I'm not making excuses for them, but you know, if you're bringing a couple of kids to a game and travel and food and all that stuff, it's an expense. It's you know, it's and if you're going week on week, so that's probably one that with the weather that weekend and everything. I was surprised, you know, because it was a big fixture and it's um, you know, a lot of people would have been in France the week before as well, so. Um, it's hard to yeah, get that's some fair off. That's for this context. There's a lot of yeah, travel with it, enough. you know. There's a lot of travel, and and for people to come up to Dublin this weekend, then it's it's, you know, it's pricey enough for them to to do that again when they've been there so many times. But you just think this fixture. Well, it's huge. It's a season. Um, it could be a season changer for. It Munster. could be career changing uh, for some players if if they if they can get a result against Leinster, it can be have a massive implication, knock on effect. There's an Australia tour coming up. If they stand out in this fixture the weekend, they could put themselves right in the shop window and uh, get on that tour and um, obviously get to a final next week and maybe win a trophy, which would be huge for Munster, given you know their progress and what they're trying to develop and build there, and, and given Leinster's dominance, uh, in, particularly in Europe this year, they were the best team in Europe and deservedly won won the competition. So there's a huge prize if if you're in the Munster mm. dressing room and thinking, "Geez, we have a chance here to." Uh, to do something special, the conundrum is, you know, where do we where do we get the win from? How do we develop a win? How do we play? Can we hurt them? Can we attack them? Can we score tries? Yeah, we've Owen Redden on the line as well. Morning, Owen. Morning. Um, just been speaking a little bit about Munster there. Get your sense from the Leinster point of view, just in terms of read some of the uh, players after last year's semi-final defeat in the Champions Cup and how that impacted on them in the later stages of the. Um, uh, Pro 12 and they kind of said that uh, it had fragmented them a little bit that actually they started questioning themselves in a slightly different way that they hadn't really expected is it possible that the like the win in the Champions Cup and all that comes with it uh, might have a not necessarily a fragmented impact on them but I mean there can be a negative impact from, from that sort of thing too um, yeah, I think there's probably a few sore bodies and, and maybe a few guys won't make, won't make it um, due to the you know, it mightn't have been the most amazing match in the world last week, but it was certainly one of the most physical I've seen um, at that level. Um, so I think you have a few tired bodies and a few guys who mightn't make it. At the same time, you've guys who've proven themselves all year in, in a Leinster jersey, and a lot of them, even in earlier rounds of the Heineken Cup and some big games, um, that then maybe didn't play in the latter stages. And thinking of someone like Ross Byrne, maybe, who if, if uh, Johnny Sexton wasn't fit, might step in there. So I think um, for Leinster, it's... it's um, you know, for the guys who played last week, it's probably relishing a challenge of, of having Munster in the RDS because the last time Leinster won a Heineken Cup and played Munster the week after was um, down in Thoman Park. And, um, you know, we definitely got sent home with, with our tail between our legs. And, you know, to have that kind of a come down a week after our winning a, a, such a big trophy, um, you know, and, and, and to people on the outside, you might have, you know, you might think you'd get over that pretty quickly. But to be honest, it was it was a tough night. And, you know, even for me, it would still live with me today, that feeling, even though you'd won a hiding cup the week before. Um, so I think for the guys who, who, who won last week and played last week, they're going to be relishing the chance of having Munster at home. For guys who didn't play last week and who are going to play this week, there's obviously a pressure on them to kind of keep things going, and, and that's a different type of pressure, you know. But all, all in all, I think it's probably a positive for Leinster to have won last week and to be having Munster at home this week. I think it's easier for them to have that game mentally than to be playing a team that they mightn't have such a huge um, rivalry with, like maybe Glasgow or, or uh, Edinburgh or something like that. I think this is a, a perfect fixture for a week after, albeit you know with some tired bodies. Yeah, that game that you mentioned, uh, 2011, and it was a Joe Schmidt Leinster team, obviously, and he kind of spoke afterwards about the fact that that Leinster team were 
uh, fatigued, spoke about things like, you know, Munster wanted this more. Like, they're all factors that can very easily apply uh, to tomorrow's game. So, like, what's the... What do they need to do differently to the way you guys would have prepared for that game or obviously the, the end result? Well, I think that the thing is at that point in our, in our, in our journey with Leinster, you're trying to be, you're trying to be, um, you know, you're trying to win a trophy. And then since then, Leinster have tried to work out how to kind of win trophies in the near term, but at the same time, look after the long term. And, and you know, and that's was one of the challenges that was very hard last year for Leinster, which is how do we, how do we look after this year and next year and the year after and still manage to win an away semi-final against um, Claremont and an away and a home semi-final against Scarlets. If Leinster had just focused on last year, last year, they may have gotten over the line in one of those competitions. But instead, Leo was, was planning on for the future while managing the short term, just like anyone would do in any business. you know. And I think because of all that planning, he's in a different spot now. You know, He's actually in a position now where he can go and win that game last week and he's got players you can then go and deliver for him this week, and they won't necessarily be the same players. So I think that work has been done, um, and you couldn't just turn it around. If you're, if you're asking yourself, OK, I've been here before, I won a Heineken Cup, what do I do differently in the next six days, or seven days between the, now and the semi-final? You're, you're gone. It's too late to worry about it then. You've got to start that planning back in September, which is what Leinster have done. Um, you know, And they really are looking after both now in terms of winning trophies this season but they've also been looking after the next few years all throughout this season as well and it puts them in a really good position for this week Redzer, it's Quinny here um, just, uh, is, it, is it easier in a sense that um, this is going to be a home game they don't have to travel like in 2011 you had to come down to Limerick um, pack up the bags go the day before, they're at home all week um, and, and maybe the experience of 2011, will that have been spoken about this week, do you think? Yeah, 100% it would have. And, you know, and if I was in the dressing room, I'd be saying it's a chance to put it to bed. You know, and I think Johnny played, Issa played. Um, so I think there is a chance for to put some demons to bed. Hard to believe that they might have still have demons in their head, but knowing them, they probably do. Um, and I agree with you, like being at home is a huge difference, you know. Um, you know, and I, when I think of it from a monster point of view, it's going to be a very tough occasion, I think. Um, I think I heard I got the tail end of your tickets thing. Like the only 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 other side of that is there's so many you know Limerick and Cork people living in in Dublin anyway that you know it's not really it's hard to kind of work out exactly um, you know what split there's going to be there. You know I think it'll be it'll be a, a, an amazing occasion just like it is every time it's been on the Aviva. Um, you know so I think the both teams will be very well supported. Um, but I think for some of the Munster players like some of the chat I heard during the week when he I thought was spot on with someone like Peter. Keith Earl is saying, you know, we get the first chance to have a tr- shot off them. And I thought, oh, that sounds good. You know, that, that's actually a really good mentality to have. But then I heard some other comments later on the week saying that there's not much difference between us and Leinster. You know, we've been to four finals, our four semi-finals in the last few years. And, and you know better than I do, like getting to a semi-final compared to winning a Heineken Cup, like the difficulty level in both of those it gets it's harder when you get different. when you get to that level, only a semi-final. It just gets harder as it cranks up that pressure. Uh, Absolutely. And I think, you know, if, if you've got Munster players saying, look, Leinster are way better than us, this is where we're at and we need to work hard to get better at it, then, or for example, this weekend we need to be really up for it because Leinster are actually obviously a good bit better than us at the moment, then they have a chance of winning. If they're going in there thinking there's not much difference between us and, you know, I, I, we're at, I, I, and they're kind of... I don't, I don't, think, they're, I don't think they are thinking that. Yeah. Maybe there's someone has said it, but I think the, yeah. the reality is I think people know where both sides are at. And we were just mentioning Reds are there. The opportunity for Munster guys, if I was in that Munster dressing room, I'd be thinking, Jesus, this is a chance to enhance my career. This can be kind of a life-changing moment because you're beating the European yeah. champions. There's a summer tour. You have a chance of winning a trophy. So there's a massive yeah. amount of motivation in the bigger picture, not just winning the game for Munster. Now, will they yeah. do it is another question, but there's huge motivation there for them, isn't there? There is. And I think for someone like JJ, who's probably going to play 10, like when you're playing rugby a long time and you're not actually in the space you want to be in, it's quite difficult because he loves big games and yet because he wouldn't be starting enough, he'd, he wouldn't be playing in the big game. So tomorrow is kind of a bit of a, an arrival for him where, where he wants to be, you know, and it is a big game and he might he'll probably get the start. So, you know, it's a big, big game for him. You know, conversely to that, you know, because he hasn't played at 10 in those knockout games before, you know, it's unfair almost to expect too much of him, you know, because you're, you're, we're all hoping that he'll go out and be brilliant and be another option for Ireland and everything. But 
Um, you know, it's going to be tricky for him. Like there'll be less space than there is in any game during the year. Leinster will come harder than they have in any game they've played against uh, Munster already. Um, so it'll be a tough ask, but I think it is set up for him in some ways um, for him to go out and have a stormer, you know. Oh, and you mentioned um, Johnny Sexton a bit earlier there, and the consensus seems to be, Rory O'Connor writes about it in the Irish Independent this morning, that uh, he isn't going to start. He's got that uh, groin strain carried over from the last game. And uh, Rory O'Connor certainly writes about uh, the likelihood that Ross Byrne is going to start in that position, and you've mentioned that as well. Joey Carby's obviously the backup 10 at Ireland. It seems he might come in at 15, is certainly one of the, one of the theories. What's the thinking behind not putting... The Ireland backup ten at ten when the first Leinster pick is out. Well, I think Ross Byrne has played nineteen times for Leinster or something about half this year and played in the in the Heineken Cup um, in the European Cup pool games at ten. And it's just a natural choice at this point for this team that he's been playing ten when when Johnny hasn't. Um, and that's so to do anything else at this point for Leinster is 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 a bit would be a bit odd, you know. Um, do you think that impacts and, and on, and, I mean, I don't know if there's a broader point in it, but certainly my reading of this morning, do you think that impacts on uh, Carberry's decision and what he does with his career um, after the season? Well, I, it's, look, I think with Ireland, you, you've, got a, you've had a train of thought and you kind of, you know, you kind of go down a certain road and then you follow that road through. And like, that's one thing that both Joe and Leo would be renowned for is like planning and then following the plans through. Um, at the moment, you know, um, when 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 Len, Leo has a plan that when Johnny's not starting, um, he starts Ross, and when Johnny is starting, he starts Joey because Joey might bring him something in at near the end of a game that that uh, might be a bit different, and like they're kind of just pushing on with those plans at the moment. You know where those plans converge, and 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 um, and what would happen if Johnny couldn't play for Ireland, for example, and how that would all pan out um, over a course of a few games would, would be would be very interesting. You know they're both very good players and. I think I don't know the ins and outs of who who's been looked at where, but both of them, of course, like if there's opportunities in other provinces to play week in week out, um, and those provinces are are strong enough, um, then of course they would look at it and think about where can I play more rugby. At the end of the day, that's what players want to do. Um, if you're not playing, to be honest, if you're in a team and you're on the fringes of it and it's winning Heineken Cups or European Cups, and Quinny will say the same to you, you don't you're not necessarily going home at night thinking you've won anything, you know. So. Playing is first and foremost, and, um, and contributing is, is a huge part of keeping your, your, your sanity when you're playing. I'd be keen to get your thoughts on, on how Munster can hurt Leinster from the halfback position tomorrow, because you look at Teddy Ira Buren's performance last weekend. It was obviously an unbelievable individual performance, but was there anything from a, a scrum half perspective that you saw that Conor Murray can use tomorrow? Well, the guy last weekend kicked very well in the mm. first half, but he was terrible in the second half. Um, you know, like standing around letting balls pop out of the rocks, and and this is Ibrahim. Like, so I, he that was a huge loss for them in the end for Mashinow. Like, if Mashinow had been playing, you know, you saw how physical Racing were without him. If he had been playing, like that could have been a different result. And also, if either of the two tens um, had lasted the game, it would have been a tougher game for Leinster. You know, I think both halfbacks for Racing in the second half were were anonymous practically, aside from um, the scrum half kicking. You know, um, this weekend. Yeah, I mean, like you know, Connor is obviously one a world class scrum half, and any any like any bit of period of time in the in the Leinster twenty two, and he's going to be a danger. His kicking game is going to be important, um, you know. But Leinster are very good in the air, and that's not always the solution. You saw against Saracens last year when in the semi final when when Munster went to the kicking game, and now Duncan Williams is playing. But against teams that are good in the air, that might work for a little bit, and then you have got to change. You got to play a little bit, you know. Um, I think I've seen enough from Munster so far this year that they can challenge them playing with the ball. You know, um, Leinster's defence in the last few weeks, however, has been has looked rock solid um, and looked very, very aggressive. So, uh, the other thing is, I think the intensity of the game. Leinster are probably more used to that intensity now over the last few weeks, and due to the amount of players they have playing at international level, and maybe you could argue Munster after the the Racing Racing um, quarter will. You know, be a bit more aware from the start. I think the fact they've had two weeks planning for this will mean they'll come up with some plans that you're referring to there, like to actually unlock Leinster. Um, where do they attack him, though, Redzer? That's that's what I'm trying to figure out, and and people are asking me. You know, where where, um, you know, aside from maybe taking on Leinster up front and the mall and around the fringes and Stander making good carries, and you know, and Munster can be very good when they get build that intensity. In fairness. Can they attack him out wide? Do, you know, get the ball to Conway. You know, Leinster's defence has been very, very good, as you said. Is there yeah, any I, I, um, 
Yeah, I think they need to like Munster's defence. You know, in the last few years, has been one of their one of their weapons, right? Like if they can if they can get off the line hard and put pressure on Leinster and 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 get Leinster in a position where what Leinster have been brilliant at this year is say against Scarlets, who are an excellent defensive team. Leinster kicked the ball all day long, you know, and still won by forty points. But they started the game, kicked the ball, and then Scarlets had to play, which meant their defence is no longer the big part of the game. Like Munster needs to kind of do that to Leinster tomorrow. Their defence needs to be. You know, as aggressive as it has been the last few years, as uh, physical, and has to really like. You know, you have to feel it in the first few minutes. When we see the first few tackles, you've got to see. Uh, oh God, Leinster aren't going anywhere here, and that's when you know you can start to get doubts creeping in, and that's when Leinster might try and do something like play a bit more than they should. You know, and Keith Earls or Andrew Conway picks up an intercept or or a penalty or whatever. Um, and I think that's the way. I think being rock solid in defence is actually the most important thing against Leinster because if. If you're solid in D, you know, and you frustrate them a little bit, the you know, they go to the you? air. Then you've got guys who are good in the air. Munster have guys who are very good in the air. Um, so I think that's probably the way to do it. Like, Leinster's defence, like, Exeter will be renowned for an excellent defensive team now, you know. And, and Leinster have really, really mastered this. You saw last week, like, they got caught in behind a few times from Racing 9 kicking long. Like, but Leinster have, over the course of the year, really worked on having... You know, a really good balance between in the front line and in the backfield. And most teams are trying it now where they have like 12 or 13 in the front line and maximum two in the back line, in the backfield, like with a full back and scrum half or full back and a winger. And like if you watch Leinster when they play teams, they achieve that setup more often than most. Um, so the simple answer is it's not easy to attack against Leinster. And up front is not the answer either. Like they're a world class pack now as well. So you've got to keep your discipline. You know, Racing didn't do that last week. Um, you've got to be very physical, you've got to defend really, really well, and you've got to be brilliant in the air. And I think if you do those four things, you know, and then you're in the game with a lot, with, with 10, 15 minutes to go, you know, and then you can kind of rely on, 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 um, on being able to play the game out and, and, you know, keeping your head for the last 10, 15 minutes and see what happens. But if you don't, if you get any of the first four wrong, you know, you're staring at a long day, I think. We're going to ask, um, we're going to talk to Quinny a little bit, a little bit more about that game. But before we let you away, on, would you get your thoughts on the other uh, semi final this weekend? The Warriors against the Scarlets at Scottstoun at, uh, at a quarter to eight. Um, Ty Byrne obviously is the kind of interesting angle on this one from our point of view and the fact that he's off to Munster next season. The thought struck me that uh, the Scarlets play a very different game to Munster. And like it'll be a whole new challenge for a player like Ty Byrne playing under a different system uh, next season. How, how do you expect him to go when he makes the transition? Yeah, I think he'll be absolutely fine. I think all, all, like at, at minimum what he's done in Scarlets is, is learn how to play more ball, you know, um, and play with the ball in his hands and, and pass and run when it's on and pass when it's on. And for anyone, that's good. I mean, Tyke's biggest strength is obviously over the ball, um, which is incredible for someone of his height. And, and as you see in latter stages of competitions, People know that he can do that, and people target him all week. They have there'll be a guy in in a, in a yellow bib for Glasgow this week called Ty Byrne, you know, at training, and they'll go into the game and they'll target him, and he'll still rob ball. And that's when you start getting into, you know, world class territory when you can do that. It's okay at start of a season when people mightn't spot you and they don't really know you're coming, but near the end of the year, if you're still robbing balls at that and that at that level, that's an incredible feat. Um, so I think he'll go really, really well. You know, he's an incredibly um, humble guy who worked really hard. I mean, in Leinster, when he was injured for so long, like, he kept his head and he, he literally didn't play for two years, you know, and was diligent with his rehab. Um, I often was injured in and out and having to train with him and, you know, literally day in, day out. And, and to see someone who, you know, could take an easy option and, and maybe finish up rugby and start, start a job or, or take a very, you know, average kind of salary and take a punt on going to Wales, you don't hear it very often. And to me, it speaks volumes about what he thought he could do in the game, you know, and, and he went over there to try and turn it around. And often when you see that happen and you see a guy make a decision like that, it's almost that kind of desire to keep going and the lengths you'll go to moving away from your family to, you know, a, a not the most glamorous part of the world, um, just to, just because you think you can and you, you think that this isn't over yet. And I think that's probably the part of his personality that, that has led him to where he is now. And which also means that, you know, he didn't go over to, to, to Wales so that he could come back and play for Leinster or Munster for a few times. He went over there because he thought he could play for Ireland and he thought he could win things with Ireland and he thought he could win European Cups. So he's exactly the type of player Munster need. They need to fill that, their team with guys who think, I can play for Ireland, I can... And don't just say it, like, but actually train like it and behave like that, that, like, that they have that desperation to win. 
um, for their club and their country. And, and I think the more players, when you get a critical amount of those players in a team, and Quinny would have been in one of those teams, you get eight, nine, ten guys thinking like that, and then, then you're back in business. And I think he's one, certainly, who, who, who will bring a bit of that to them. We're just seeing some shots there of uh, youthful Owen Redden and a youthful Alan Quinlan. Uh, and not I, today or yesterday. Me and I knew Reds are in training <laughs> and, and on the pitch and we played against each other as well. But look, uh, we had good fun anyway. And it's, uh, I, you're, I value your opinion there because um, you know it's intriguing to hear how you're, you're talking about how Munster are going to try and attack and maybe mm -hmm. play to their strengths, which yeah. a big part of that is the kicking game as well. Owen, excellent. Thanks a million for joining us. No problem, guys. See Cheers. you now. Thanks a lot. Owen Redden there uh, on the line. Um, just a quick one on Tyke Burman before we get back into the game. Um, yeah. What about that point about the different style that Scarlet's playing? It's a much more sort of running game maybe that he might be used to when he gets to Munster. Is that just... I mean, Owen seems to think it's not really a great problem that actually it's when he comes in... It's not a great problem because you know just what he's doing and, and maybe if, if, the, if, if the 10 situation changes or if somebody comes in in the, in the 10 position that they maybe might change their game a bit and develop it a bit more. And look, Johan van Graan is only in a couple of months. And I think what Rassi Erasmus did when he came in is he made Munster very robust and Jack Nienenberg defensively, um, made him really good at their kicking game. And they played to that, that kind of, to their strengths there. And then, you know, they have a lot of good ball carriers and they relied on that kind of relentless intensity. And it got him a lot of great results last year. When you come to the business end of the year, um, Adrian, you know, you need that extra little bit of variety and attack. And look, every team will strive to, to, to be like a Leinster now, to be able to roll up your sleeves and play it, kind of get down and dirty and mm -hmm. play it. You know, like he said, up front, they can maul. Their, their ball carriers are excellent. They're brilliant at the breakdown. They have a good kicking game. And if the game gets a bit ugly, they can kind of play that game as well, which they showed last week. So, you know, that's, that's what every team will strive to, to have. And there's no team that just wants to say, well, we don't want to be an attacking team. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to attack. So he'll actually bring some attack and some variety, particularly out around the midfield and open phases where he can do little, you know, little loop plays and stuff like that and offloads and stuff. So he'll, he'll help that situation. Okay, does he want to play in a team that are going to kick it so much? So I think he'll probably have an ambition to play a bit more as well. So he'll want that. So he'll actually bring some new ideas as well, maybe of stuff that, that he's learned in the Scarlets, like Reza was saying. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's a problem. He's not yeah. coming into a team who are going to be really negative, if you like. I think they'll want to be more positive with the way they play, particularly from what they've learned last season and this season. Yeah, I think he was, a, uh, he was let go by Leinster, obviously, and a guy who was given an opportunity over He's there. He's a bit of a late developer and, and with superb hands, opportunity. Yeah. And you mentioned there... Um, we let Redzer go on a monster as well. And I know, what yeah, happened. Yeah. And Sean Cronin. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> we have a couple of monster men who've achieved incredible stuff in, yeah. in Leinster as well. So it can happen. Um, I, I enjoyed your little sort of under the, under the, under the table dig there at, uh, at Leinster. Um, well, all their monster, monster success uh, incoming. Um, you mentioned 10 at Munster next season. Is it just a case of that they might... You, I think you said they may make a change there next season. Is it a case that Blaindale comes in and he's the guy in possession and, and I mean look it's not any any criticism directly at any one of the three but I think you guys both know consistency in yeah. such a pivotal position is important and in big games you need so you need we've had players. Ian Keatley has probably been the mainstay this season Tyler Blaine the last season JJ has now come into the, the picture so there's a lot of chopping and changing um, I know that happens in the league scenario if one of your tens is away with Ireland, which is uh, the, the, the Leinster situation, two of their tens are away. But I just think that consistency has created uncertainty with performance, with confidence, with self belief. You know, they need to get that position filled uh, by somebody who's going to be their number one choice. Somebody to, you need one of those injury. three to step up and, and say, know, I'm the man. Yeah, and perform at a really high level in the big games, in these big pivotal games. And unfortunately, the big games that they've lost, like last year Saracens games, game, you know, Tyler Blender didn't have his best game and he had a really good season. Maybe Ian Keatley's performance this year against Racing. You're talking about control mm. under massive, massive so what pressure do you do? at a different yeah. level. Well, look, you're looking for top quality and you're looking for... Let's bring someone in? Well, yeah, possibly, I think, yeah. I think, well, look, this uncertainty and, and we don't know what Tyler Blendell's injury is. And look, in fairness, he played superb last year and there's been times this year when Ian Keatley's been superb as well. Um, but it's it's that world-class position scenario where you look at teams who win big trophies have 
world class in those positions or and it's not always hard, easy to get world class and, and again it seems like it's a massive criticism on the current guys but more competition and higher level which can even bring on you see what Sexton has done with the Carberries, with the Ross Burns. it actually brings you learn so much off these guys and some one of them has got to take the lead if Munster don't sign somebody they've got to take the league lead and you know be in the Irish setup, mm. so you want your ten in, in provincially to be challenging. Carberry would be a good well. fit. Well, if he if he if it happened, yeah, either Ross Byrne, I think Harry Byrne, his brother, is yeah, apparently he, as, well, as good if and not has better. A trend yeah. with Ireland as well, you know. So um, there's a lot of quality here in Leinster, and I look, all the provinces would be looking at someone like that. But it may not happen. There's a lot of complications. The three out halves are, are contracted next year in Munster, so I don't know how they work that one out. Mm. I was one of the 10s and what do you do? You pay someone out or you ask them, do they mind going to another province? Well, that's not going to work. So I don't know how this thing is going to play out. Tomorrow should, say, should uh, shed some further light on it, but how big is uh, the gap between Munster and Leinster once you add Tigburn into the situation? Well, the gap is... is um, it's hard to measure that gap, Owen. Um, I think Leinster... The gap with Leinster and, and the vast majority of teams in Europe, based on what we've seen, the evidence we've seen, because you look at them... Um, Glasgow were flying it in, in, in the league um, Leinster go and get a bonus point win and you're mm. like geez, this is a serious enough performance mm. um, then they go to Exeter um, and really have to dog out a win as well against a very physical abrasive Exeter side who were champions of England um, in a very intimidating place Sandy Park is a tough place to go and they get the job done there they go to Montpellier then in uh, round 6 was it the last last game and um, you know another away a really impressive away performance against the the top 14 leaders so you know you're talking about the gap between Munster and Leinster the gap between some of these big teams is is Leinster are out in front and they've shown that but then I think you know you 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 Ty Byrne coming in Arno Bota signed now he's replacing Robin Copeland um, you know maybe if you get another second or another tight head and maybe a, 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 a 10 so they're probably two or three positions away from going putting down putting a team on paper and saying this is a really really good side this is an exciting side because you have Taute Scannell uh, Sam Arnold has been really good Chris Farrell comes Farrell, back that's yeah. four good centres you have a lot of pace in the back three um, Sweetenham Wooten Earls Conway and Mike Haley signed from Sale um, so you're looking at a little bit of depth then. Um, I think then, you know, you go up front and, and uh, there's a lot of good players there as well. So a couple of key positions would help them. The difference with Leinster and those other teams that I'm talking about is the depth. Yeah. And you're talking about depth that there's not a huge difference. Jack McGrath will come in this week. Mm. There's not a lot of difference between himself and no. Keane Healy and, and either one could... Jack McGrath could come and take the reins again because he's such a quality player. He's, you know, was on the lines last year. Um, Andrew Porter, great backup for Tyg Furlong. Um, Reese Ruddock, Jack Conan. These guys are going to come in, and, and you could slot any of these guys into an Irish team at the moment, and they perform. So it's that depth enables obviously Leo Cullen cope with so many internationals away. So he's created a lot of depth, and the A and B scenario. That's where they're ahead of other teams, is the depth. On paper, if you get everyone, if Munster get everyone fit, you know, and maybe one or two signings, the gap isn't as huge on paper that way, but I think the gap is big with the depth. So are Munster going to beat Leinster B? Uh, it's Leinster A and a half, or <laughs> B and a half, whatever way you look at it, I'm not sure. Call it I, I don't think that... Um, part of me thinks, uh, earlier in the week I thought, look, they're too good. They have so many strings to their bow. Their attack is superb. If you're going to beat Lens, uh, a team as good as Lens, you've got to score tries. You've got to have variety to your game. And I, I, I think the frustration of watching Munster against Racing, where they couldn't break them down, I kind of envisage a scenario like that where Munster just, you know, give it everything and play with a lot of pride and passion that it'll just come up a little bit too short. But then there's a little bit of a chink of light with maybe possibly no Sexton, no Robbie Henshaw. Um, world-class players mm. you take them out of that group I know we're talking about the depth and uh, if I was in the Munster dressing room and, and honestly I'm getting, getting a bit kind of fired up about this in the last day or two that this is a massive challenge you're, it's backs to the wall stuff you're going to the RDS you're playing the European champions 
do we go with the scripts and say, well, you know, we throw, we give it everything, we get a pat on the back for a good effort and Leinster go on to the final? Or, do, or can I affect that? Can I step up here and, because it is a life-changing thing, this, you beat Leinster, you're in a final, you win a trophy, you could end up jumping on a plane to Australia, you could win Joe Schmidt over, there's a number of guys in that position and um, it's a massive thing. So that kind of gives me a little bit of um, uplift, if you like, that maybe Munster, if they, if they adopt that approach, and I think they will, um, I just worry that they'll maybe come up short with a little bit of execution and quality and, and Leinster maybe will learn from the past, particularly in 2011. So Leinster on paper will win the game, I think, slightly. Right. That's, um, it's not a bold prediction, is yeah. it? Like it's no, it's not a bold prediction, but I'm surprised to hear you say I mean, well, you know, I'm not going to wear the, you know, I'm not going to go, um, well, Munster, I think Munster can, and yeah. believe me, I'll jump around the RDS tomorrow and be delighted if they do, mm. and I don't have to hide that to anyone. Um, but, you know, on paper and, and quality-wise, Leinster, I think, um, you know, probably get over the line. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. all right. Do you think... Um, um, I think Lens will probably get it done, to be honest with you. I think that uh, freshening it up with potentially, like they're talking about Carberry, even at 15, you know. Back us up here, on um, a bit of hope uh, from another fr- monster. Fr- fr- freshen, it up, freshen it up at 10. Like, a, a lot of these are sort of enforced, but actually I think there will be a benefit to, like we spoke at the very top of the conversation with Owen about 2011. About a bit of energy, yeah. Jo, jo, that was a Joe Schmidt team in 2011, right? Like, this is a guy who leaves no stones unturned in terms of that week-long turnaround. And it's the same dynamic. Um, but I think that that bit of freshness of the players, I think Maybe. that Stuart Lancaster, I think, will have a big impact this week in just, terms of... Yeah. Just on that, like, I know you kind of facetiously asked the question, Munster versus Leinster B tomorrow, but is it kind of a bit grim if Leinster comfortably beat Munster tomorrow, given... I don't think it'd be comfortable either way, right? Like they comfortably it's, beat Munster, absolutely it is grim. But he, Okay, so even, say, a, a narrow win after the celebrating that's been done this week... No, I don't. I, listen, I don't. I think the celebrating this week would have been far different than in two thousand and nine or two thousand and eleven or two thousand and twelve because of 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 maybe you know dragging it on till Wednesday or Thursday before you go. Okay, we now have a match against Munster at the weekend in a semi final or final. I think the sole focus, particularly with the coaches, they wouldn't have let themselves go as regards right. Yeah. How do we play next week? Who are we select and who are we going to train? Here's what's the plan for the week. So I think the focus would have been really uh, very, very narrow and ready to go straight after the game. And that's that's professional rugby now. So I think the players, of course, they would have had a few points and had fun and enjoyed it. But I guarantee you their game faces were on earlier this week than they were on in 2011. And that'll make the Munster win even sweeter than tomorrow. Well, you get it. Like you do get a chance to have a look at the the, the game last week from a Munster point of view and have a look at some of that racing defense. Like Johnny that, that, said that it after the game, nar- st- that sort of um, shallow defence. And Reggie has said it. Just yeah. stop Mon- Leinster, and that's out of respect. You try and stop a brilliant team who are really good at attacking, and and when they get on the front foot, they can really dominate. So you get in their faces. You defend well. You stay connected in defence. You hurry the breakdown. You slow it down. If they get quick ball, they're very, yeah, very yeah, lots yeah. of threats yeah. and good, yeah. intelligent players, Adrian, who make good decisions. Mm-hmm. And and intelligence is something that's not kind of um, mentioned enough because players in the heat of the moment making good decisions about ball carriers, getting in a little bit of space, recycling the ball, which leads on to, and builds up to other stuff. So they have a lot of intelligent players. But I I do believe Munster will you know um, they'll give them they'll give it a good rattle mm-hmm. and hopefully they can look. I'm saying it as a Munster man, I think it'd be good for Irish rugby if, if Munster were to get, get across the line here. It would make it more of a competitive, keep that competitiveness between the rivalry because Leinster win again, it's, is that gap getting mm. bigger? Well, it's 4-2 in the old Champions yeah. Cup uh, tally as well, Quinny, yeah. as you know. So yeah, well, look, uh, you were second up Everest anyway, so <laughs> that's fine. But then went up four times, so that's, uh, yeah, you know, that yeah. sort of makes but up the flag was already up there. <laughs> so every time you go up, just remember us. I think the, even in the context of Irish rugby, the uh, Ulster Ospreys came Ulster had the flag well, up, actually, first Yeah, they really did, yeah. yeah. So I mean, it better, was... Better, yeah. uh, they did get a bit of an escalator to yeah, give them a bit of a help up, at least part of that. Helicopter ride halfway. Just a couple of quick comments, because I know we're holding you from your porridge. Darrow Toole says, Leinster missing a lot of key players. It'll be interesting to see uh, a real test of this Leinster depth. And uh, Trevor here, you can take this as you wish, but uh, I wouldn't build that game up too much, lads. Leinster fans couldn't care less about the Pro 14. Oh, brilliant. And the players aren't bothered as brilliant. there's no real rivalry. <laughs> Just want to be on holidays now, he says. 
Uh, good chance for Munster to get a trophy, though. It'd like, be nice. It'd be nice. <laughs> it's going to become a battle of who cares less about this game. Munster giving back a thousand tickets, and it's like in the well, post match. I tell you, I guarantee you, there's no players in that field tomorrow will care less. About they will themselves. care absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Quinny, pleasure as always. Thanks, minute. Thanks for coming Thanks, into lads. us. It's Alan Quinlan previewing the uh, game of the weekend. So let's uh, take a quick, like, quick clip here of Laurie Sanchez, who uh, has been speaking to Nathan and looking back at Wimbledon's so-called crazy gang on the show last night and how the team's antics would go down in 2018. Yeah, they wouldn't have been acceptable today. I mean, no bones about that. There would have, there would have been accusations of bullying and well-founded accusations of bullying. I think John Scowers brought it up in the video himself. He, he felt, he didn't say the word, but he felt intimidated by mm. some of the stuff that went on. Players did make it at our club. I mean, good players came in and for one reason or another, they couldn't deal with the situation at the club um, with everything that went around, around it. So, yeah, I made no bones, you know, that that club as such couldn't survive in the modern day with the modern scrutiny, the modern era, the modern snowflake generation would not be possible to, you know, <laughs> there'd be court cases left, right and centre. Um, but it was 30 years ago and the culture, whether people like it or not, culture 30 years ago is completely different to the culture now. Um, you know, some would say today for the better and I'd probably agree with that, you know, so, certainly some of the some of the things we got up to or what happened in the dressing room, you, you're not accepting any dressing room today. But it was a different time, and, and much as you can you can talk about what shouldn't have happened then, if it shouldn't happen today, different generations have different standards, you know. Mm. Um, I think famously, <laughs> I was just reading the paper today, they're going to show the Dan Busters film in 40, 400 cinemas, and they're going to just leave the original name of the dog in it, which you obviously can't say today, because it, it, it's a completely non-acceptable term. But in the 19th 40s, there was nothing that was thought of it. So, you know, there are different generations, and, and the, the, the producer of the film said, you have to accept what was acceptable at the time. You can't, in hindsight, look back on it and say, well, today it's not acceptable, therefore we have to rip down everything that went with it. Um, you have to get on with it, and you, you live in the area that you live in. Yeah, Laurie Sanchez talking to Nathan last night about whether their antics would uh, wash in 2018. I mean, there are some would say that they shouldn't have washed it in uh, 20 years ago either. But there we go. OTBM, by the way, brought to you this morning with AIR, the home of AIR Sport. Get amazing live sporting content free with AIR Broadband. Uh, do I let you know as well that uh, this day, uh, uh, next week, we're going to be at the home patch of Bull Hayes. A, not this day next week, but next Wednesday, we're going to be at Bruff Rugby Club. It's the Heineken Rugby Club back on the road. Wednesday, May 23rd, live from Bruff, the home of two Ireland rugby legends, Fiona Steed and uh, John Hayes. Eddie O'Sullivan is also going to be joining us there to preview the final week of uh, the rugby season and to look back in an epic year for Irish rugby, which included a Champions Cup win and, of course, a Grand Slam. And we'll have a team uh, in the Pro 14 final. Tickets are free, but you're going to need to register now, so just head along to offtheball.com forward slash events and use the password Bruff RFC, all one word. It's the latest off the ball roadshow in association with Heineken Rugby Club, live from Bruff uh, next Wednesday evening. I have to say, I am very excited for that one and I'm very much looking forward. I think some tickets are still available if you want to get yourself along to uh, Bruff Rugby Club in Limerick to check out all of that good stuff. Episode two of The Hurling Show is coming your way from half past 12 today. It'll be on the, all the usual off the ball social channels. Do subscribe to us on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Uh, and you'll get the notifications when we're uh, when we're live with these shows. It's Shane Stapleton, Michael Verney, Kieran Joyce interview there as well, and the tactics board ahead of the weekend's action. So lots of good stuff to come there tonight. And off the ball, by the way, Ocean McConville and Brendan Venny on Armagh up against Fermanagh and Tyrone against Monaghan in the Ulster Championship. Michael uh, Dar McCauley, the interview uh, from OTBM during the week will feature there as well as the crappy quiz. Championship Sunday, by the way, coming your way on Today FM on Sunday morning as well. It's back on your radio from nine o'clock. Uh, this Sunday morning and you'll be in the company of Anthony Daly and Peter Canavan along with uh, Nathan Murphy and John Duggan. So that's coming your way on Today FM on uh, Sunday morning from 9 o'clock. But that is pretty much it from us uh, for this morning on 25 past 9 on this morning. We've had a good innings. Yeah. Not Kevin Cabal, mind you, but a good innings. Uh, it's absolutely the, um, really shocking. To be quite it's honest. become almost it's a feature of this show, isn't like it? It's a Friday morning and... Uh, 
Kevin Kilban is not uh, is not on uh, on the show. Sorry, we've just heard uh, Tommy Rooney call him a fucking bollocks uh, into our ear, our producer. So a uh, very good morning to you, Kevin, if you're watching. That's what our producer thinks. Borrowing from the uh, John Waters dictionary. Yes, yes. Uh, what a dictionary it is! Uh, a very a glossary of mm. kind of uh, fun Indeed. terms. Uh, pleasure on uh, your hangover. Uh, hot sandwich Friday, I presume, is is on the cards. I'm, I'm, I'm just very emotional that it may be the last time that I've uh, that I'm going to see the Rolling Stones. First, first and last. last time, yeah. yeah, I was going to think of done. That was my main thing. That like uh, I got I got the tickets because I wanted to go and see them at some point in my life. I've done it now. I don't really feel as if I really ever need to go back and see them again. I kind of think that's. That's yeah. it for me. That's yeah, you, you'll definitely be the interesting guy in the pub when somebody's like, I did the Trans-Siberian Railway, and you're like, yeah, I saw Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, good luck, good morning. OTB AM. In association with AIR. Get AIR Sport free with AIR Broadband.